a great producer called Jimmy Wolf offered the L shaped room. There it is. Do you want to play that part? I said, my God, yes. It's the best part of the year. So uh, this is uh, how it started. And it was a wonderful experience. You're not English, are you, dear? No, I'm French. Oh, French, oh yes. Well, that's nice, isn't it? Nice to travel. It had been written for an English girl and James Wolfe chose me and there was a presentation to the press and the press was not hostile but questioning Mr. Wolfe, why do you have a French actress? And, and uh, he said something rather cruel. He said, she's sexier. <laughs> well, I suppose in those days, English actresses didn't have the reputation they have now, which is great beauties and very well trained and very beautiful. Anyway, it was a fabulous part, but really heavy to play. There were so many dramatic scenes and it, it always takes a lot out of me. I really admire actresses who can go from one big scene to another. And I remember I used to tell my cameraman, Dougie Slocum, uh, Dougie, how much time are you going to take to light the next scene? And he'd look at me and say, how long do you want? sweetheart <laughs> and I'd say 20 minutes and he'd say you got it mm. <laughs> so I would sleep you know while all the hammers are going on they're putting things in front of the lights and I would just sleep and recover Brian Forbes was only supposed to write the script and my director was supposed to be Jack Clayton and Jack uh, called me and said, listen, Leslie, I can't do the film. I'm going through a divorce and I can't do both the divorce and the film. <laughs> so I, I begged to buy bow out. And I said, that's too bad because he really was a great, great director. I was looking forward to working with him. But then uh, Jimmy Wolf, the producer, asked me, well, who do you want? Who would you like? Who else do you, would you like as a director? And I said, I had just seen the first film done by Brian Forbes called Whistle Down the Wind, absolutely adorable. And I said, why don't we ask Brian to direct it as well? And Jimmy said, fine. So this is how we went ahead. I liked his uh, sort of uh, East End accent and he was very simple and down to earth and uh, I really met him after he gave me this, the script to read and I thought that somewhere this is slightly dated because the girl is very passive she lets all those terrible things happen to her and doesn't bounce back. She doesn't take her life into her hands. So I said to Jimmy Wolf, uh, listen, I'm a bit disturbed about that. And he said, talk to Brian. So we had a meeting with Brian and I was explaining uh, in a tactful way what upset me slightly and he was with a piece of paper doodling and it seemed like he wasn't paying any attention to what I was saying and I was repeating myself two three times thinking for God's sakes isn't he going to listen to me and to make a comment and so I finally stopped and he presented the pages and said, is this what you mean? 
<laughs> and he'd rewritten the main scene. And this is what we shot, wow. where the girl, you know, heads back and said, I have the right to love and I have the right to have made a mistake. And if you think that makes me a tart, well, I'm sorry for you. It's, it's a strong scene. And I was thrilled. I was delighted. I said, yeah, that's it. Sorry. What are you sorry for? Nothing to be sorry about. I'm not sorry I met you. Without you, I might never have had the baby. One has to have love. If you take that away, there's nothing left. I was still a girl from that period when having a child out of wedlock was a complete disaster. I mean, we've seen a few films now, like uh, Philomena, where the child is taken away from you by parents who are shocked socially. It's a social uh, attitude towards an unmarried mother. And so this was, I was raised a Catholic too. So this was really a very daring subject and very daring in France and in England, also in the Western world. So that was, uh, you know, quite a, <laughs> quite a challenge, uh, a big, big uh, moral challenge. And uh, it took it very seriously, really endorsed the character and enjoyed very much playing it. However, it really was at a cost. I found it uh, difficult, the sort of fight she makes for her child's life and for her right to have a child and still keep her head high. Well, let's say uh, 60 guineas. Mm? What could be fairer than that? One thing could be. What's that? You could perhaps try and find out whether I'm pregnant before making your generous offers or spoiling one of your weekends. You could perhaps try and ask me, it's only a formality, if I even want to get rid of my baby, if there is a baby. I don't suppose that would occur to you when all those guineas are at stake. You want to have the baby? Yes, now I do. When I came in here, I wasn't sure, but after listening to you, yes, I do. Anything's better than your way. You ought to meet my father. You have a lot in common with him. And this one made money, I think. This one was very successful, even though it was tawdry and dreary and it wasn't glamorous. It, it was realistic. So this was very new for England. And I think it made a tremendous hit in America as well because of the same reason, because of the taboo, religious and social taboo. Uh, but it uh, was a huge success, and I think that out of that success, first of all, I was nominated for the uh, American for the Oscar. I think I had uh, the foreign, whatever it's called, I forget, Foreign Award, Press Award, and uh, and moreover, Cary Grant offered me his next comedy to play opposite him in his next comedy. Oh. So I thought, my goodness, there I'm playing this realistic, dramatic part for the first time in my career, really dramatic, realistic thing. And uh, Cary Grant offers me a, a, a Cary Grant comedy. It's too much. It was fantastic. I got the British Academy Award too, which was not yet called the BAFTA. It was called British Academy Award. Don't offer me a glass of wine, you. I mean, you mustn't feel embarrassed because we've only just met. I'm not proud. My name's Toby Coleman, by the way. 
as in mustard. Uh, look, I'm not on the make or anything like that, far from it. Old passion spent, you know? You, uh, want to offer me a glass of wine? No, not particularly, Mr. Coleman. Huh? Well, that's fair enough. Oh, Tom Bell was a remarkable actor. He was just the new wave, the new style of acting, very simple. He'd been on the stage and he had fabulous technique and was just very modern. I think this was probably his first film, his first big break, and he just took to it like a duck to water. He was excellent. Brock was wonderful, a, a delightful American black actor. But he, we were still in a period, I mean, it, it isn't over when there was a lot of sexual prejudice, uh, racial prejudice. And he uh, was extremely conscious of that. And in between the scenes, we would play in the park of the studio and I noticed how Brock was extremely careful never to touch me. You know, we were playing with a balloon, with a ball, and catching each other and all sorts. Of, but he was, this was still a period when a black man touching a white woman was a no-no. So, but we, of course, had a wonderful relationship uh, from heart to heart. He was an adorable person and uh, not at all a homosexual like the part de Mons, but he played it very well. And uh, I just, yeah, enjoyed. But that was my first experience with a black actor. We're still your friends. It's not the same. I don't know you from yesterday. How you think I feel lying there listening? Friends, my friends. I, I had a good friend in Toby. He always, he always talked to me before. Well, working on the Elship Doom wasn't a piece of cake. I can't say I had uh, fun memories, except once in a while th there'd be a break and we would go in the park and play with the ball and run around and <clears throat> giggle. Otherwise, it just was stern and unrelenting. Uh, <clears throat> I think I really did enjoy when I felt a, a scene had gone very well. I mean, that's what an actress wants. That's remarkable, that's just terrific. That's fun, in a way. And it destroys me. I love you too, but it still destroys me. Toby, wait. There must be something. If we love each other, there must be something. Must yeah, be... like what? By me giving it a name? I thought the finished film was remarkable, very moving, very real. It had hit its mark. Thank God we, I mean, Brian was, Brian Forbes was exactly right for directing this film because he knew about, you know, the, way, the East End of London difficulties. And as a matter of fact, the funny thing is that we shot all this in uh, Notting Hill, which now has become the most fashionable and expensive neighborhood. But when we were filming, that was the slums of London. We didn't have to have extras. People were in dire financial difficulties in that neighborhood. All the buildings were peeling, dirty windows, dirty steps, dirty streets. And I remember playing the main scene when I come in, in the beginning, and we were told be very, very quiet in between the scenes because there's somebody desperately ill on the front, in the front room. 
And uh, so it added to the drama of playing in. They didn't have to disguise those peeling buildings. They really were crummy. And uh, the people in the streets were not play acting. The day before I came for looping, which is dubbing, I had seen Jules et Jim by François Truffaut. And I was, wow, this is la nouvelle vague, this is the new style. Uh, this was really a new style of directing and acting. Extremely light and cutting all what I would call the dead wood coming into a door, closing the door. You know, all that sort of corridor scenes. You jump, cut to a new scene, to a new uh, set of people. And it, it, there was something so new about that. And I thought, ooh, are we too late? But I guess it took about a year for England to catch and get uh, this French new wave style. So when we came out, I thought the film is terrific. But I thought I have just seen the next style, the next style of filming. However, I was, I was quite pleased. Got some belongings, have you? Uh, yes, I have to go and get my things. I see. You're living somewhere at the moment, are you? That's nice. Just wanted somewhere better, I suppose. Well, that's natural. All right, then, dear, I'll leave you to it. Got something on the stove downstairs. Anyway, expect you want to start making the place look a bit more like home. The L-shaped room was really a complete breakaway for me because Hollywood demanded you to be always charming, lovely, smiling, and uh, all sorts of uh, cliché reactions. And when I was given this part, I said to Brian, listen, Brian, I was so trained to smile in front of the camera. Would you please make sure you wipe that smile off my face? Just keep me on the straight and narrow. Take care. Huh? You too. Yeah, well. You, you take care. Huh? And I thought this is pretty damn good. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. I think this is this is very good. And I thought I have wiped the smile off my face and I was able to portray dramatic scenes without the Hollywood touch. I was very pleased about that. <laughs> 